They say, cash is king. But in the world of investing, it's all about cash flow is king. In this video, we're diving deep into the art of analyzing a company's cash flow statement. Whether you're a newbie investor just starting out or a seasoned pro, I promise that by the end of this video, you'll gain fresh insights and valuable knowledge to supercharge your investment research process. Stay with us till the end, and you'll walk away with actionable tips you can apply to your investments today. Let's dive into the world of cash flow statements, also known as the statement of cash flows. Picture it as a financial compass that tracks the flow of cash in and out of a company. A positive number signifies cash entering the business, while a negative number represents cash leaving it. This statement offers investors a peek behind the financial curtain, revealing how a company's operations are running. It answers questions like where the money comes from and how it's being spent. Why is it a game changer? Because it tells investors how much cash a business generates, a critical factor in determining a company's stock price. In simple terms, the more cash a company turns out, the more valuable its stock becomes, all else being equal. Before we dive into the nitty gritty of the cash flow statement, let's get familiar with its structure. The cash flow statement is neatly divided into three distinct sections. One, operating activities. Two, investing activities. Three, financing activities. Each section plays a crucial role in painting the financial picture of a company. Let's break it down further. The operating activity section is your window into the cash generated from a company's core business operations. In simple terms, it tells the tale of cash earned from products or services. These activities encompass receipts from sales of goods and services, interest payments received, income tax payments made, payments to suppliers for goods and services used in production, salary and wage payments to employees, rent payments, and any other operating expenses. This section unveils the financial heartbeat of a company's day-to-day -day operations. Let's keep going. Next, there's the investing activity section, where we dive into a company's investment moves. Here, you'll find the sources and uses of cash related to a company's investments. This can include purchases of property, plant, and equipment, investments made in other companies, expenditure on acquiring entire companies. What's interesting is that the investing activity section often shows up as a negative number, especially for growing companies. Why? Because they're using cash to expand and invest in various ways. Think of it as the cash they're putting into new locations, equipment to produce more goods, or even acquiring other companies. It's all about fueling growth. Lastly, there's the financing activity section, where cash from financing activities tells a fascinating financial tale. This section involves sources of cash from investors or banks, uses of cash paid to shareholders, payments of dividends, payments for stock repurchases, and repayment of debt. Here's the deal. Changes in cash from financing activities can swing both ways. It's cash in when a company raises capital, like issuing bonds to the public, showing up as a positive number on the cash flow statement. But when the company pays back borrowed money, it's a cash outflow, reflected as a negative number. This section holds the key to how a company manages its financial resources and interacts with investors and lenders. It's a crucial piece of the puzzle. Now that we've grasped the cash flow statement structure, it's time to dissect a real company's cash flow statement, line by line. We'll uncover the key insights that every investor should keep an eye on. For this journey, we'll turn to Coca-Cola, a global icon among companies. Our journey through Coca-Cola's cash flow statement begins with the first line, the company's net income. This figure represents the profit a company has made, and it's the go-to metric when discussing earnings. It's important to note that net income is calculated on a different financial statement, the income statement. By the way, if you're interested in diving deeper into how net income is calculated, I've got a video on how to analyze an income statement like a hedge fund analyst. You can check it out to learn more about this crucial aspect of financial analysis. 
It's been well received by many, so consider watching it after this video to enhance your financial statement analysis skills. In Coca-Cola's cash flow statement, nestled between the net income and operating cash flow, lies a fascinating element, depreciation and amortization. This often represents one of the larger numbers in the cash flow statement section. At its core, depreciation is the method by which a company writes off the value of an asset over its expected useful life. Almost any asset loses value over time, and companies can use this depreciation as a tax-deductible expense each year. Jumping back into Coca-Cola's cash flow statement, let's explore a crucial section, the operating activities. Here, the ultimate aim is to figure out the net cash provided by these activities commonly known as operating cash flow. Nestled between the net income and this operating cash flow line, there are several key items to focus on. First up is depreciation and amortization. In many companies, this is one of the heftiest figures in the cash flow statement section. Keeping it high level, depreciation is essentially writing off the value of an asset over its expected useful life. Virtually every asset loses value over time, and companies can account for this loss by writing off a certain amount each year as a tax-deductible expense. Consider Coca-Cola's scenario. They purchase equipment for $1,000, expecting to use it for five years. Therefore, its useful life is five years, and it depreciates by $200 annually, calculated by dividing the equipment's cost by its useful life. However, Here's an interesting twist. Coca-Cola paid the $1,000 for this equipment in cash up front. This makes the $200 annual depreciation a non-cash expense, since it doesn't involve actual cash leaving the company each year. As a result, when calculating cash from operations, this depreciation and amortization expense must be added back to the net income for the year. This might seem counterintuitive at first, but it's a crucial aspect of understanding the nuances of cash flow. It's a topic so rich and complex, it could easily fill an hour-long discussion. But for investment purposes, this high-level overview should give you the essentials you need. Moving forward in the cash flow statement analysis, the next key item to focus on is stock-based compensation. This is when a company compensates its employees with stock options or shares in addition to or instead of cash. For example, at a company like Google, an employee might receive $150,000 in cash and an additional $50,000 in company stock each year. This method is particularly prevalent in the tech industry, as it's a strategic way to motivate employees to stay longer and align their interests with the company's success. Although Coca-Cola isn't a tech company, and therefore, their stock-based compensation is relatively low. This is a critical element to scrutinize when analyzing tech companies. To give some context, Facebook reported a staggering $6.5 billion in stock-based compensation expenses in 2020. Similar to depreciation, stock-based compensation is also considered a non-cash expense. This is because it doesn't involve actual cash leaving the company. Consequently, when calculating cash flow from operations, this expense is added back to the net income. This adjustment is vital for investors and analysts to understand the true cash generating ability of a company, as it provides a clearer picture of how much cash the company retains and uses for its operational needs, investments, and growth strategies. Diving deeper into the cash flow statement an essential item is the net change in operating assets and liabilities, also known as a company's working capital. This reflects the cash needed for short-term operations, like paying suppliers and managing customer receivables. In growing companies, this is often a negative number, as expanding operations demand more cash. For established companies like Coca-Cola, this number can swing between being a cash inflow, positive, and a cash outflow, negative, from year to year. For instance, in Coca-Cola's case, this line item provided cash in 2020 and 2019, but was a cash use in 2018. This fluctuation is a vital indicator 
of how a company manages its short-term financial health and operational efficiency. All these individual line items culminate in one of the most crucial figures on the cash flow statement, net cash provided by operating activities, also known as cash flow from operations. This figure signifies the amount of money a company generates from its core business activities. It's a key metric in assessing the financial success and health of a company's primary operations. Moreover, cash flow from operations is foundational for calculating a company's free cash flow. Free cash flow holds immense importance in business valuation as it represents the actual cash a company has available after covering its operating expenses and capital expenditures. It's essentially the money left over that can be used for paying dividends, making investments, reducing debt, or expanding the business. The significance of free cash flow lies in its ability to measure the profitability and future growth potential of a business. Whether it's a stock, an apartment building, or a small enterprise, the intrinsic value of any investment is fundamentally tied to the amount of cash flow it can generate throughout its lifespan. Thus, investors and analysts heavily rely on this metric to make informed decisions as it offers a transparent view of a company's financial capabilities beyond just its net income or revenue figures. To unlock the mystery of free cash flow, we start with the cash flow from operations number. This is our launching pad. From here, we dive into the realm of capital expenditures, often affectionately called CAP-EX. This is where a company spends its cash to buy, upgrade, or maintain its big ticket items. Think properties, plants, buildings, tech, or equipment. CapEx isn't just about expansion. It's also about keeping the lights on and the wheels turning. Imagine a company like Coca-Cola. If they decide to expand a factory to meet a surge in consumer demand, every dollar poured into that expansion is CapEx. It's a critical move for growth, but also a hefty cash outlay. Now, where do we fish out this CapEx number? It's neatly tucked away in the investing activities section of the cash flow statement under the line titled purchases of property, plant and equipment. This line is like a treasure map guiding us to see how much cash a company is channeling into its big future focused projects. Understanding CapEx gives us a peek into a company's strategy, whether they're gearing up for a growth spurt, innovating, or just keeping their operations in top-notch condition. We need to take an extra step to figure out net cap X. This isn't just about how much a company like Coca-Cola is spending. It's about understanding the real cash impact of their big asset moves. Here's the play. Start with the number for purchases of property, plant and equipment, PPE, which for Coca-Cola in 2020 was a negative $1,177 million. But wait, there's more to the story. We also need to consider the cash Coca-Cola got back from selling off any of their assets. This is where the proceeds from disposal of property, plant, and equipment enter the stage. For 2020, let's say Coca-Cola made $189 million from selling off some of their PPE. To get the real deal on their CapEx, we add this $189 million back to the negative $1,000 $177 million spent on PPE purchases. This move reveals the net CapEx number for Coca-Cola in 2020, a negative $988 million. Now to calculate free cash flow, we take our cash from operations of $9,844 for 2020 and subtract out net CapEx of 988. This leaves us with 8,856. Remember that these numbers are millions. Coca-Cola's impressive $8.8 .8 billion in free cash flow for 2020 underlines why free cash flow is vital. It's the real money that can be used to reward shareholders. With this pot of cash, companies can pay dividends, buy back shares, or reduce debt, all of which can boost shareholder value. Free cash flow is a crucial indicator of a company's financial strength and its ability to benefit its investors. To enhance your stock analysis, consider using the free cash flow yield. This is calculated by dividing a company's free cash flow by its market cap, resulting in a percentage. For example, 
Coca-Cola's free cash flow yield has been around 3 to 4%. Generally, a higher yield suggests a company is efficiently generating cash relative to its market size, potentially indicating a good investment. Another useful metric for evaluating companies is CapEx as a percentage of sales, which measures a company's capital intensity. It essentially tells you how much a company needs to spend to maintain and grow its operations. You calculate this by dividing the net cap X number that we determined earlier by the company's total revenue. For instance, Coca-Cola spends about 3% of its sales on CapEx each year. This percentage can vary widely across different industries due to their varying asset intensities. For example, a railroad company, which requires substantial investment in infrastructure, will typically have a higher CapEx percentage compared to a software company, which may not require as much in physical assets. This metric is crucial for understanding how much a company is investing back into its business relative to its sales. Continuing our journey through the cash flow statement, we next venture into the investing activity section. Here, two important items catch our eye. Purchases of investments and proceeds from these investments. When a company finds itself flush with cash, it often channels some of that surplus into short-term, low-risk investments like short-term government bonds. This strategy is more than just parking money. It's about actively generating returns. Instead of letting the cash idle in a bank account, earning minimal interest, these investments work to squeeze out some extra income. This approach helps a company make the most of its available funds while keeping risk at bay. Next on the cash flow statement are acquisitions and disposals of businesses, a common practice for companies aiming to expand. These acquisitions often involve entering new geographies or product lines and can vary from buying 100% of a company to making a significant yet partial investment, owning, say, 10, 20, or 30%, but not the entire venture. For example, in 2019, Coca-Cola invested a hefty $5.5 billion in business acquisitions. This included the purchase of Costa and a substantial stake in CHI. Such moves are key things to watch when researching a company. It's crucial for investors to note if a company is heavily investing in acquisitions, as this can signal growth and expansion strategies. Conversely, companies also sell off businesses or brands that no longer align with their long-term strategy. These disposals are recorded in the line item, Proceeds from Disposals. These sales, just like acquisitions, are important to understanding a company's strategic direction and how they manage their portfolio for optimal growth and alignment with their core objectives. In the financing activity section of the cash flow statement, an important line to examine is purchases of stock for treasury. This shows how much cash the company is using for share repurchases. Share buybacks indicate that a company may believe its shares are undervalued and is a way to invest in itself potentially increasing the value of remaining shares. This spending can be a key indicator of the company's financial strategy and management's confidence in its future growth. For long-term investors, it's encouraging to see a company capable of simultaneously investing in growth and repurchasing shares. Share repurchases can be a powerful tool, and I'll illustrate this with two examples, one general and one specific to Coca-Cola. Imagine a company with $100 in earnings and 100 shares outstanding, giving it an earnings per share, EPS, of $1. Now, suppose the company buys back 10 shares, reducing the shares outstanding to 90. This action changes the EPS calculation. Now, the $100 in earnings is divided by 90 shares, resulting in an EPS of $1.11. By just reducing the number of shares, the company has boosted its EPS by 11% from $1 to $1.11 without increasing its actual earnings. This enhancement of EPS through share repurchases is a significant benefit for investors. It's a strategy that can increase shareholder value, making each remaining share more valuable in terms of its share of the company's earnings. 
This is a key reason why share repurchases are favored in certain investment strategies. The relationship between Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway and Coca-Cola highlights the effectiveness of share repurchases for long-term investors. Initially, Buffett bought 6.2% of Coca-Cola. Over time, without purchasing any additional shares, his stake increased to 9.3% due to Coca-Cola's share buyback program. This program reduced the total shares available, thus increasing the value and proportion of existing shareholders' stakes. Buffett's 50% increase in ownership, achieved passively, underscores the power of share repurchases in enhancing long-term shareholder value. To fully understand a company's investment in share repurchases, it's crucial to consider the line titled Issuances of Stock. Share issuances work in direct contrast to repurchases. While repurchases reduce the number of shares outstanding, issuances increase them. To accurately gauge how much a company like Coca-Cola is spending on buybacks, we must subtract the cash received from issuing new shares from the cash spent on repurchasing shares. When we apply this to Coca-Cola's 2020 figures, an interesting picture emerges. It turns out that Coca-Cola didn't effectively spend any cash on buybacks that year. The cash inflow from issuing shares significantly exceeded the outflow from repurchasing shares. This financial maneuvering is why Coca-Cola's total number of shares outstanding actually increased in 2020, as opposed to decreasing, which is the usual outcome of share repurchases. This kind of analysis is essential for investors to understand the real impact of share repurchase programs on a company's share structure and financial health. Moving on to dividends, Coca-Cola stands out as a significant dividend payer. In 2020, the company paid over $7 billion in dividends to its shareholders. Tracking the trend, Coca-Cola's dividend payouts have been consistently increasing $6.6 .6 billion in 2018, $6.8 billion in 2019, and over $7 billion in 2020. For many investors, a steady or rising dividend payment is a sign of a company's financial health. If a company reduces or maintains the same dividend year after year, it can be perceived as a red flag, indicating potential financial difficulties. A useful analysis involves combining the total amount spent on share repurchases and dividends, and then dividing this sum by the company's free cash flow for that year. This calculation yields a percentage that shows how much of its free cash flow a company is returning to shareholders through dividends and share buybacks. A percentage over 100% is generally seen as unsustainable in the long term. It suggests that the company is paying out more to shareholders than it's generating in free cash flow, possibly leading to increased debt or dwindling cash reserves. However, a single year like Coca-Cola in 2018, showing this trend isn't necessarily alarming, but it's an important factor to monitor. So there you have it. If you found this video insightful, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to Wealthwise Finance. My mission is to empower you to become a better investor. I'd love to hear your thoughts, so please drop a comment below. Also, stay tuned for an upcoming video where I'll be diving into how to analyze a balance sheet like a hedge fund analyst. Until next time, happy investing.